All right, so in lesson two, what we're going to be going into now is the actual resources that we can provide with APM, the different kinds of resources, some of which are the types of resources that require a connectivity session and will require that extra license, some of which do not require a connectivity session. So it's important to kind of identify those. We're also going to talk about what a web top is as well. We'll start with that. Now you guys are should be familiar with the web top because we use it here at F5 as well. Um, easiest way to define a web top is it's a landing page. This is a landing page that I have all of the resources that have been made available to me. Earlier, just a couple of hours ago, I talked about the dynamic resource access where I'm at work and I have all these resources available to me. Then I take my laptop home and I have less resources available to me. I know the resources that are available to me because I see them on my web top. So when I get home, there's not as many icons available to me. There's not as many resources that I have available. Each one of these represents one of our different types of APM resources, such as portal resources that we talked about. A portal resource is taking us to some sort of an internal application for our company. We also have what is called a web top link. A web top link is typically an external resource, like Concur Solutions for us here at F5. We don't manage that inside the F network. We go to another third party for that. We also have the remote desktop resources I talked about. Windows servers, Windows workstations we can RDP to, Citrix clients. And then finally we have the network resources that we can also make available to users as well. We're not going to go into network resources in this lesson, but we'll go into the other three. But first off, uh, web top. I can get by with just one web top and I can use the one web top that the wizard creates. If I go in and I use the wizard and then if I want I can customize the web top a bit which we'll talk about at the end of this lesson. But it's also completely viable that you might have multiple web tops for different groups of users. Your employees might have one web top and your partners might have a separate web top, and each one will have a different look and feel. And so for that, we might want to create more than one web top. So we can come here to go down to the bottom. You're going to see the web tops, and then we go to the web top list, and then we can click on create. Create a web top is very simple. Modifying it is not so simple, but creating it is very easy. All I need is a name. A type. There are only three types, and there are only two types that you guys will ever use, which makes it even easier. You may use a network access web top. A network access web top is ideal. It's perfect if all you're doing is giving your users network access, and that's it. Nothing else. A network access web top does not create a landing page. There's no landing page they get to with an Eric Access web top. When I access a VPN policy where all I have is network access and a network access web top, as soon as I'm authenticated, it immediately establishes my network connection and the, the web browser, the web top, is just there to hold the connection open. But I don't need a landing page. Does that mean uh, the end user is allocated an IP address from a pool? They are allocated an IP address from a pool, correct. Mm -hmm. Makes them a full TCP IP client while they're sitting at home or while they're sitting at Starbucks. So yeah. that end user is not able to move laterally within the network to access an other unauthorized resources or IP addresses. So I'm not for sure. example, what do you mean laterally? For example, if I'm going to ping another device within that same subnet, or other subnets within the network. Sure, you can do that. But isn't that a security? Well, then you can lock them down using an access control list. But by default, when you provide network access for the 10.10.0.0 network, they have access to everything inside the 10.10.0.0 networks. 
Again, they have access to it. That doesn't mean they can log on to the SQL Server. It just means they can get to the SQL Server if need be, but they still have to have the local rights to do anything inside the network as well. So it doesn't override any local permissions that are on file shares. Doesn't mean I can log on to the Active Directory server. I still have to be able to log on to the Active Directory server. It just gets me to the Active Directory server if I try to, mm -hmm. in the same way that you could try to get to it inside the network. You just won't be able to log on unless you're an admin. A portal access webtop is like backwards compatibility. It's what we used to use when the full webtop didn't exist. We used to only have two webtops, but a portal access webtop you're never going to use. Um, because it was essentially replaced by the full webtop, the functionality of it. The portal access webtop does not let you put multiple resources on the page like we just saw. It does not let you do that. To do that, you want to use the full webtop. The full webtop is what we just saw in the previous slide. That's the true mix and match of lots of different resource types on one landing page. So that's the one you're going to probably use the most. Does an end user, sorry. Does an end user get uh, allocated an IP address to the web? No, only with network access. Oh. Only with network access do we have IP address pools. These three options are, you can you know select them. The first one makes no sense to me, personally. What this says is as soon as they get their web top, let's hide it down here in the system tray so they can't see it. And what's the point of having that? So I usually remove the first one, and we'll take a look at what this does in a few more slides, the resource search option. I think you typically want network. to include that one. If you just had network, the top one could be useful. I think that makes sense. I'm sorry? If you just had network, that top one could be useful. Uh, network does that by default. I don't even think it gives you the option. Oh, really? okay. I don't think it even gives the option. Of, it might. It's been a while since I actually created a network web top, to be honest, network access web top. But yes, with the network access web top, we do want that to hide because they don't need to see it. Uh, the page itself, the web page. Again, if you want to play with network access, do the do the actual hand, hands-on demo that you can do in your VLAB. Answers a lot of the questions. Now, this is what the default web top is going to look like when you create one. It's pretty bland, pretty gray, gray for us here in Seattle. I guess that's why we have it because we're you know, in Seattle. And believe it or not, our customers, even though our customers love F5, they don't always like the F5 logo on their web top. Also, you'll notice these names are not very friendly, like that, you know. Um, if you don't do anything when you create these resources, it will create a caption for each resource, and the caption is going to be the exact same name as the resource name you give. <coughs> and as you hopefully know, we're not allowed to have spaces in names of objects in Big IP. So if you don't change the caption, it's just going to make those names the same, the captions the same as your name. That's not very friendly. And those images are pretty bland. So we can do a lot of different things here. We can actually apply captions and, in some cases, descriptions to a lot of our different resources if we want. We can apply custom images if we want. Just note that when you're uh, using custom images, look how small they are. So if you use some really you know, sophisticated, uh, uh, nice image, it's gonna shrink it down and they probably won't even be able to see what it is. So keep that in mind. We can also change aspects like the logo, some of the colors that are on the screen over here on the right. We can change some aspects of what we see up here in the, the, the title. We can also change these group names, the grouping names of these resource types. You can call those whatever you want. You can change the footer text down there, the bottom. This is your resource search right here, that one checkbox that we saw in the full web top. This is helpful if you've got 50 resources on here. It's actually really tough sometimes to find the icon you're looking for, so you can type it in there. But notice I've also customized that default text 
that's inside of that resource search. So the way this works is if I start typing a resource name, it'll pull up just the resources in question. That's very useful and friendly for your user friendly. I don't know why you would remove that checkbox when you're creating the full web top. But here's even one more thing we can customize. If they type in some text uh, and there is no resource that matches that, notice we also have an error message up there and we can customize the error message they hit. This is a combination of what I call the easy and the intermediate modifications we can make to our web top. We also have advanced modifications you can make because you can make this page look however you want. You can make it look just like your customer's current portal, but that's going to require some advanced XML skills. Somebody needs to be able to do that, but it can be done. But this is all easy stuff to do. You mean HTML skills? It's, it's all written in XML. Oh. So let's review these different resource types that we're going to talk about here. The first is the portal resource. Again, this is pointing tip, uh, to internal web applications. The web top links typically pointing to external web applications. What's nice about the use of APM with these external use resources, I don't manage these in Lorax. These are not Lorax resources. So these really essential, actually, you know, I'm jumping ahead. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, what I wanted to say. Then we also have the remote desktop resources that we talked about to get into manage things from home using RDP. And then finally, what I call the client server app, also known as an app tunnel. And a client server app is some sort of an application that our users are using, where on the server side, there is going to be one or more servers with one or more ports needed for the server side of the application. We can set that up as well. So let's start by talking more about the portal resource. So a portal resource, again, points to an internal application or even a web page. Go all the way walking down to just one web page. But there's one requirement to a portal resource, and it must be an HTTP-based application, an HTTP website. So for example, if you're using some sort of an HTTP-based chat program, then you could make that a portal resource. If you're using Skype, which is not HTTP-based, that cannot be a portal resource. So there's a reason why a lot of organizations are still using and still like making portal resources. Um, one of the drawbacks to using an SSL VPN in general, and this is not just APM, this is any SSL VPN, all of our competitors. One of the drawbacks is that a lot of the features that we want to take advantage of require agents to run on the user's devices. Those agents are going to run within their web browser, i.e. Chrome, so forth. And all of the web browser developers of the world are trying to make their web browsers more and more secure. So they're trying to lock down their browsers from running any of these agents. And that can cause problems with any feature that requires an agent to run. So the benefit of using the portal resource is it doesn't require any agents. No agents on the client side, so we can make this available to pretty much all of our users, no matter what browser they're using, no matter what device type they're connecting from. That's a nice thing about it. We can set this up, we can get started by using that second wizard that we saw, the portal access setup wizard. That'll just get us started with a policy and a single portal resource. All the rest of the portal resources we'd have to create manually. I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. But let's talk about how APM treats portal resources. So APM is a reverse proxy. 
it acts as a reverse proxy. All SSL VPNs act as a reverse proxy. And here's what that means. So one of our resources that we have is our internal Outlook web access, which you can see is available, oa.lorax.internal.com. Our virtual server is identified, our users access HTTPS slash VPN. .lorax.com, that's how they get to their resources. So the user's gonna go, they're gonna see all of the resources available to them, and one of those resources is Outlook Web Access. So they're gonna go ahead and open that resource. That's gonna trigger APM to go grab that resource for the user, and as we're getting the data back on APM to send to the client. What APM does is it does this reverse proxying of the web page to send it to the client. And what the client is gonna see is they're not going to oa.loraxinternal.com, they're going to vpn.lorax.com, and then there's all that gobbledygook after that, this hashed, this is a hashed name, or this is a hashed value, I should say. It's a hashed value of this internal name. And you will, any reference, any reference to this name on any of those web pages, you know, any links that reference this host name are going to be reverse proxy to look like that. The idea here is to hide, hide the identity of this internal resource to my users. That's the purpose of the reverse proxy as that layer of security. So when I create, as I said, I'm gonna run the wizard. The wizard will create my first portal resource, but now I have to create a bunch of other portal resources for all these other internal applications. So I can go to my connectivity VPN, Portal access, portal access list, page, click on create. And once I click on create, I can now start creating my resource. Name, again, remember, no spaces here. So I use the underscore character, but other people do something different. These settings here, you don't typically need to do anything with these. We have the same kind of options in Aventail way back over 10 years ago, sometimes the reverse proxying process causes a page to not display properly. Something on the page doesn't display, and that is never the fault of the reverse proxy. I guarantee it, it's never the fault of the reverse proxy. When you have web page components that aren't working properly, because of the reverse proxying, it's usually because they were coded uh, without the best practices. We'll just say that. The web developer coded things with hard links and, and it, uh, it made things where the web page is gonna break when we try to do reverse proxy. So instead of going back and trying to have them redesign the whole website, we can call support and the support will probably have them turn off some of these checkboxes. That's essentially turning off reverse proxying for some of these different components of a web page. Otherwise, if your web page displays properly, you can leave all those assets. Then we're going to select the internal resource itself. This can either be an IP address of the internal website or the fully qualified domain name of the internal website. Just knowing that if you're using this uh, big IP does need to resolve that name. You do need to have some sort of DNS set up in order for big IP to do that. And then down at the bottom, this is where, as I said earlier, if I don't, if I overlook this, it's just going to give the caption name, whatever I named the resource. So I want to have a more friendly looking resource name or caption, excuse me, and optionally a description. Now here's an interesting note for you guys. This description field has a very low character count. I think it's like maybe 20 characters, might even be less. So you can't get too wordy with your descriptions. 
And then finally, for your image, you can click on Browse, go to your hard drive, and find whatever image file you want to use for that icon. Again, remembering that you don't want to use large resolution images. Very small little thumbnail images is really all you want. And all that, browse that, there you go. As another reminder, once I'm starting to use portal resources, the virtual server that's making this access profile available does need to have that rewrite profile attached, which the wizard would have done for us. The wizard would have done that automatically. Once again, if I'm uh, using these portal resources, is that something that I have to think of about connectivity session licenses with my customer. If they're using portal resources, do we need to have any kind of a connectivity session license discussion? No. I think he's saying no. If you're using portal resources, why would you not? I don't know. I'm, a, I'm asking you. I don't know why it seems logical to me. Why do you say that? Just it, it's not it's not just a virtual server that's attached. You know, that, I think that was the rule. If it was a virtual server, you could. Yes. Do that I, I think we stated pretty clearly earlier that anytime you're giving access to a network resource or a portal resource, that is going to consume a CCU. So if I'm using portal resources, then I'm going to have to start thinking about connectivity session licenses. Why? Because APM's doing some work here. APM's doing work. Reverse proxy. So we make if APM has to work that hard, we're going to make people pay for it. All right, a web top link is another resource type. A web top link, here's how you can get to the page. A web top link acts like just a favorite in your browser when you click on a bookmark. It's really nothing more than that, but it can have one additional feature, one additional function. So for example, for us, when I could click on Concur, I could have had a bookmark for Concur. It would have been no different. It just takes me to the Concur page. That's really all a WebTop link is really doing. But we can add one element that APM provides that can make it nice to use these WebTop links. We use it with our WebTop link for Concur. When you go to Concur, you have to log in. You need to log in to Concur Solutions. But when you click on the Concur link, it doesn't make you log in. How do we bypass that? Because we're using single sign-on. We're using the APM feature single sign-on, which does require that whatever username and password you use to log in to the, 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 the page, like last time you used sales user uh, um, password, that has to be the same username and password they used to get onto this web application, or else it's going to fail. Every time they click on the link, it'll be like, all right, login failed. So that's the nice additional thing we can use when it comes to web top links. And by the way, we can use single sign-on with portal resources too, but you don't usually have a second form of login for an internal web application. But you might, and if you do, you could use single sign-on. Uh, when I create the WebTop link, it's just like a portal resource with less options than a portal resource. We give it a name, we select the URL that we're going to be going to, put in a user, uh, I'm sorry, a caption, description, an image. Now, APM is not doing reverse proxying for these. It's just pointing them. It's just saying, here you go. That's how you get there. So with that in mind, do you suppose WebTop links consume a CCU, connectivity session license? No. They do not. WebTop links do not require connectivity session licenses. So I can have a WebTop full of WebTop links. My users access it. They're going to consume an access session. But all these WebTop links, no CCU, no CCU. But the moment they click on one portal resource, they're consuming a CCU. Uh, we've already answered that question, haven't we? Another resource type we talked briefly about is the remote desktops resource. Again, this is what gives you the opportunity when you're at home, you're an administrator, or you're at the airport, or you're at a Starbucks, 
you can pull up your own RDP and manage the Exchange server or the IS server, and all that is going to be going through a PM. So we'll go to our connectivity, BDI, remote desktops, click on create. Now there, uh, there's my name again, same thing. But there are three types that you can create here. We have the Citrix RDPs, the VMware View desktop RDPs, and then your standard Microsoft Windows RDPs. The settings that you're gonna have down here will be different based on which one of those three you select. So you can play with the Citrix on your own time, you can play with the VMware View on your own time because I don't have slides for those. But uh, we're gonna look at an RDP, that's a Windows. And for the most part, these are very similar to any other RDP settings you've seen if you've done a lot of RDP work. Um, we need to know where we're going. This again can be a host name or an IP address. The port will typically use 3389 unless for some reason you've changed that inside of your organization. You can use a single sign-on here. There it is. You can use single sign-on so that as long as their login for the Exchange server is sales underscore user, then as soon as they log on to get their webtop, they can just click on that little link, open up RDP, and it logs them right into the server. They don't have to do a secondary login for that. And of course, we want to do a nice caption, description, and image potentially as well. So we can have an RDP resource for all these different servers that are being managed. Keep it in mind though, we probably don't want these RDP resources to display for all of my users. I don't want my employees having access to these links. Maybe just my admins. Because what's gonna happen is when my employees see that link, they're gonna click on it, it's gonna connect them, but their login's gonna fail. They don't have the login right, so they're gonna just be confused and it's just adding unnecessary icons on the user's web tops. But we'll get into that after lunch, how we're gonna do that. So the last resource type is called an app tunnel. And this is the one I've been referring to as a client server application. So let's say at Lorax, we have this application that was developed for us for users to do their, their, block, their uh, time card. When they get to work, they open up the client side on their workstation. They say, I'm clocking in now. And that request is sent to the server side. On the server side, this is not a web app. This is a, a, a you know, a client-based application. So on the server side, it's not receiving port 80 or port 443 requests. It's re receiving requests of different ports that the application developer designed. So we have to make a resource on the server side that's listening on all the servers and all the ports needed for the server side of this application. That's what the app tunnel is gonna be for. Again, I call this the client server app. So we'll give it some sort of a name, a representative, caption description. Doesn't look like there's much here, does it? Well, that was easy. Click on create. But that's just creating what I call the container. That's the app tunnel container. What is it gonna contain? Different servers and different ports for the application. So as soon as I'm done with that, you'll notice down here at the bottom, this is where I can now add all those different servers and ports. And for each one of them, when you click on add, you're gonna have the server information, the IP address, the port information, the port range. You can do some compression. That means it's gonna compress the application traffic back and forth between the server and the client. And that's it, then you click on create. Um, it does have this uh, option here, the application path. What that means is, if I specify this, I'm identifying the path of where that client app is installed on all of my workstations. What that's gonna do is when I see my web top 
and I click on that little icon, not only is it opening up a connection to this backend server, it's also going to automatically open up my client app so that I can put in my login information. But in order to do that, that application has to be installed in the same location for every user, same path, or else you can't utilize that nice feature. So it might have looked something like that. Notice I'm using the program files variable. So I don't have to put in C colon slash program files. This can also be tricky when you have Macs because their paths are totally different. So this custom app is using two different servers, two different app servers, and each app server is listing on a couple of different ports in order to make that client server app work. And that's how we do the app tunnel. They're a little bit more cumbersome to create than our other resource types. You definitely want to test those out to make sure they're working before you deploy it out to all of your users. So now we've created four resource types. Portal resources, web top links, remote desktops, app tunnels. We now want to make all of those resources available to all of my different users. We're going to do that within the visual policy editor. So this is what your VPE is going to look like after you've run your wizard, after you've done your portal access wizard. We've asked to do authentication, so it's added that, and then we have this advanced resource assigned. That's where we give out the resources that are available. I'm going to go into that item, the advanced resource assigned, and you'll see that by default, the wizard only gives access to one portal resource and the web top both of which were created within the wizard itself. I now want to add all these other resources that I created. And again, I feel like this should be somewhat intuitive on how I'm going to add some additional resources on this page. I'm going to use the Add Delete button. In addition, we've got some fairly easy to identify tabs here. Portal Access, App Tunnel, remote desktop, web top links. That doesn't seem very complicated either. Each of those tabs, you'll notice, has two numbers. The first number is the number of that resource type that is currently being given out in this policy. The second number is the number of that resource type that's available to give out. So I now just need to go to one of these tabs, like Portal Access, I see all the portal resources that we've created on this APM box, and I can just select the ones that I want to make available to my users. And I can go to the next tab and do the same thing. Select those, and then the next tab, and so on and so forth. This does not seem that difficult to me. But I just go ahead and update. And you will notice you got now you can see all of the resources that are being provided. And when you save this, you guys saw in your last exercise that anytime you are making these modifications with NAPM, you do need to apply the policy, just like in AFM where you have to commit those changes to the system. And then when I pull up my web top, I should now see all of those different icons. I recommend you do this. I recommend you pull up the web top and test out all of them. Make sure they're all coming up as expected. If not, maybe we have a typo in one of our resource names or something like that. Now, before I get into the exercise, I want to point out a solution that I think is a very viable solution that can work, and I have a demo on this as well, in one of my APM demos that's available, I think could actually be very useful in a lot of scenarios, a lot of real world scenarios. And the, uh, the idea here is I have an existing LTM, and it has a variety of virtual servers, BIP1, BIP2, all the way to BIP50. We have 50 different virtual servers 
that our employees access for a variety of different things. Time card entry, HR information, intranet, you know, and so forth and so on. And each one of those, of course, points to a different pool down here on the LTM. So with this setup right now, my employees have to remember the host name for the first bit, the host name for the second bit, the host name for the third bit. They have to remember all these different URLs to go to each of these different applications, and that's very cumbersome. What we can do is we can either add APM on this same box, or I could have another APM up here. Either one will work. And I can create a web top. That's easy to do. We just talked about that. My web top. Then, for each one of these virtual servers, these are public IP addresses. We had to make these public IP addresses so that our users could access these from home. So if they're public IP addresses, I'm going to create an APM resource for each one of these. I've got two options. They're all web apps. They're all web apps, so I have two options. I can create a portal resource for each one of these, or a web top link for each one of these. In this scenario, what would be the better option? The one? Why would that be a better option? First off, a web top link can be used because they're public web applications, they're public websites. So they're just like any other public application, and that's what a web top link is for. Pointing us to any public website. So why would a web top link be a better choice than a portal resource? Do you get SSO with web top links? I don't think you do, do you? You can. Yeah. What were you saying later? Nothing comes in the... No CCU. If I made all these portal resources, we'd have to worry about CCUs. If I made all these web top links, none of those are going to require a CCU. That means this solution, all we need is APM and the free access sessions that come with it, and we'll never need a CCU. Now, my employees are going to access one VIP. The one VIP is the one that takes them to their policy. They log in. They're going to get their web top with all 50 links on it, and now they can just click on the link they want. They no longer have to ever remember any URLs. But I can go one step farther, and I can start using authentication to identify maybe not all employees need all 50 links. I could actually even fine-tune that even better now by using some authentication options. I'll talk about that later. So I do have a, a demo that actually walks through that exact scenario so you can see how to do that. And that's also in your demo folder on in that VLAB package file that you've got. Let's take a look at that after class. Very easy to do, really. <clears throat> so your next exercise, you're going to create a brand new access policy and profile. You're going to use the, the portal access wizard. Then you're going to create some additional resources. You'll create another portal resource. You're going to create a couple of web top links. One of your web top links will actually be pointing to a virtual server, just like this. It'll be pointing to one of the LTM virtual servers, so you can see how that would be done. You're going to create an RDP resource for that Windows server image that's inside the network. Then you're going to customize your web top a little bit by changing the logo and the color scheme and all that kind of stuff. And then test it out. Look at that web top, make sure it looks proper.